Hello and welcome to Season 3, Episode 6 of the Victorian Periodical Parade. We are still reading from the works of Catherine Lord. This episode is from the Bulgravia Christmas Annual, 1896. This short story is titled, That Delightful Stranger. I invite you to leave any comments or insights or reactions to today's episode on our Facebook page or on Instagram. I've recently received a few DMs mentioning the episodes, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much for your feedback. I hope you enjoy today's reading. That Delightful Stranger Belgravia Christmas Annual, 1896 Who's that? Bill? Stranger. Have off a brick at him. Such is the traditional reception of strangers in certain parts of England. It is doubtless inhospitable, but if we shingle-side folks had acted in the same manner some years ago, what disgrace and annoyance we should have been spared. Be grateful, then, all you that feed. I suffered because I was too greedy. Was the inscription on the tomb of a lady who fell a victim to excessive indulgence in melons. But we shingle-side residents only suffered from our too great kindness of heart in tendency to think well of everyone. It is perfectly untrue and a base insinuation of that vulgar manufacturing set to say that we were so easily taken in because the newcomer brought letters of introduction from a baronet. Shingleside is one of the prettiest seaside places in England, and up to ten or twelve years ago was one of the most select. A few large landowners held all the estates and kept out the cheap builder. Very few new houses were erected. No one cared to sell for building purposes. There was a large manufacturing town some miles inland, the inhabitants of which would have liked nothing better than to invade our little paradise. But for years we, the resident gentry, kept them at bay. Shingleside had only one hotel and very few lodging houses, and no more could be built as no one would sell land. So, though a few outsiders invaded us in the autumn, we were never overrun by the vulgar tourist horde. The manufacturing people came and grumbled at the scanty accommodation and coveted the pretty houses of the residents, but never affected a settlement until about a dozen years ago. Then a great misfortune fell on Shingleside. One of the largest landowners in the neighbourhood died, and a nephew, a Colonel Tomlinson, came into the property. He was a poor man and a radical, and immediately began to ruin our pretty little town. In a few months all dear old Mr. Gray's property was cut up into building lots, and in about a year... Shingleside bristled with villa residents, all occupied by soap boilers and retired drapers from the manufacturing town. It was a terrible blow to us, resident gentry. Our society had always been so select. Of course, we never mixed with the new set, but they annoyed us all the same. The quiet of Shingleside was gone. Then the new people were so horribly rich and their lavish ways tempted the shopkeepers to raise their prices. This was extremely inconvenient for many of our best families were by no means too well off. Even Lady Sophia Montague, who lived in the prettiest house in the place and was, in a sense, the leader of our society, was not overburdened with wealth for an earl's daughter and a baronet's widow. In fact, it was no secret that Lady Sophia resided at Shingleside instead of at her larger house in Norfolk Park in order to nurse the property against the coming of age of her son, Sir Algernon. Oh, that Sir Algernon! What troubles his carelessness brought upon us all! But I shall come to that part of the story by and by. 
Probably no one in Shingleside knows all the details of the imposture practiced upon us as thoroughly as I do. Not because, as I hear that odious Mr. Horrocks said, I am the most gossiping old maid in Shingleside, but simply because, being a member of one of the oldest families among the Shingleside gentry, and knowing all the best people in the neighbourhood, I have heard the full particulars of the story narrated, in some instances, by persons to whose society Mr. Horrocks is never likely to be admitted. <clears throat> To return to my narrative, I have said that the invasion of the manufacturing people annoyed us old residents in many ways, though, of course, we never visited them. Some of the younger members of our best families, the young men, I mean, were less particular. It must be confessed that our society, though extremely select, was a little, a very little dull at least so the young people said. Now, money was of no consequence to the trade set, and I am bound to own that they kept the place alive with balls and picnics and tennis parties, and often induced young people from our circle to join in these diversions. Even Lady Sophia's son went once to a party at the Horrocks's, much to his mother's annoyance. But young men are so terribly subversive and radical in their ideas. I was sitting on my lawn one day, chatting to the rector and a few friends who had dropped in to afternoon tea when Lady Sophia's carriage drove up. Now this is fortunate, she exclaimed as she walked through the open drawing-room window. Miss Milbert, you have been kind enough to assemble together exactly the people I wanted to see, and have saved me a long drive to execute Algernon's commission. And what is the errand your ladyship is bound upon? asked the rector, as he brought her a chair. Oh, only to ask you and Miss Colville and Miss Milbert and any of our other kind friends to show some attention to a young friend of Algernon's who is coming to Shingleside next week. Algernon has been travelling with this young man, Mr. Ingotstone, on his vacation tour, and the young man thinks of coming here for a few weeks, boating and fishing. Algernon told him he would give him an introduction, and he says... Here, Lady Sophia referred to a letter she produced from a reticule. You will find Ingotstone in addition to Shingleside society. He's a capital fellow, a connection of Lord Mortimer's. Selby met him years ago at Mortimer Towers. I believe he's well off. He's a most amusing companion and a first-rate lawn tennis player. The Shingleside ladies ought to thank me for sending him to you. A slight shudder went round our circle. To say the truth, eligible young men were sadly scarce at Shingleside, while marriageable young ladies were in plenty. I saw Miss Colston, who was a widow, with five daughters, all devoted to lawn tennis, look quite animated. I shall ask Mr. Ingotstone to dinner, of course, said Lady Sophia, folding up the letter, and I shall bring him to call on you. Miss Colville, and I dare say you will be charitable enough to introduce him further. And it was thus decided to make Mr. Ingotstone free of our best circles. Alas, we had not the wisdom of the black country. I was among the first persons privileged to behold the new arrival. I was calling at the rectory when Lady Sophia and her son's friend appeared. Mr. Ingotstone was certainly a handsome, gentlemanly young man, and fully justified the favourable opinions we had formed of him. Lady Sophia only stayed to introduce the stranger. She did drive to the station to meet a friend from London, but Mr. Ingotstone remained chatting for twenty minutes, making himself so agreeable that when he rose to take leave, the rector asked him to stay and dine. The Colvilles were the most hospitable people in the world. They were well off and liked to keep a kind of open house. They had no children but had adopted an orphan niece, Caroline Trent, a pretty girl of eighteen. She was not at home this afternoon, however, having gone to a lawn tennis tournament. 
Mr. Ingotstone seemed delighted to accept the invitation, but demurred at his lack of evening costume. Nonsense, said the rector. We dine in half an hour, and there is no time for you to return to the hotel to change your coat. Miss Milbird will be kind enough to join our party and keep you in countenance with an afternoon toilette. And so the matter was settled. You can wash your hands in this room, said the rector indicating the door of a dressing-room opening off Caroline's bedroom. Mr. Ingotstone had no coat to change, but his toilet occupied so long that the dinner-bell had rung before he joined us in the drawing-room, an incident we remembered afterwards, though none noticed it at the time. The evening passed most agreeably, Mr. Ingotstone revealing that a good voice and a skilful touch upon the piano were among his accomplishments. Miss Colville, who was very musical, was enraptured. When Caroline Trent descended to breakfast the next morning, the tournament had concluded with a dance and she was not home till her aunt was in bed. Both the rector and his wife were full of praises of their late guest. Have you a headache, child? You look so dull, remarked Miss Colville as she handed the tea to her girl. No, auntie, but an annoying thing has happened. I've lost my watch. Lost, lost your, your watch? watch, echoed her uncle and aunt in chorus. You must have dropped it at the tournament. See what comes of late hours, said the rector. No, I've not done that, uncle, for I never wore it at the party at all. You remember the Mertons called for me before I was quite ready, and I ran downstairs in a hurry. As soon as I was outside the door, I found I had not put on my watch. Miss Merton offered to drive back for it, but I did not think it was worth troubling her, for I knew it was safe on my dressing table. But when I came home last night, it was gone, and... Caroline hesitated for a minute. My gold locket was gone, too, and that was in my dressing case. But how could they be gone? said Miss Colville. Not a soul went upstairs except Anne to turn down the beds, and you can't suspect her. The Colville household was chiefly composed of old servants, staid, responsible retainers of twenty and thirty years standing, who were almost family friends. Like most of their kind, they were a trifle tyrannical in small things, and Miss Colville regulated her household with a due regard to their susceptibilities and prejudices. But to suspect any of them of theft? The idea was preposterous. Twenty or thirty years' service with such liberal employers implied the possession of comfortable savings, and Anne, the housemaid, was probably quite able to buy watches and trinkets for herself, had the desire for such things filled her breast. Miss Colville was worried. She hated mysteries. Nobody went upstairs but Anne, she repeated. And Mr. Ingotstone, said the rector. Well, of course, he doesn't count. The unlucky loss of that watch and locket effectually spoiled the comfort of the Colville's house for the rest of the day. Caroline was grieved for the loss of her property. The locket was her uncle's gift. The watch had belonged to her mother. Mr. and Miss Colville were naturally disturbed at the mystery and the rector, in cautiously mentioning the occurrence to old John, when he came to clear the table, raised a storm not easily allayed. Anne, who, although a damsel of discreet age, had susceptible feelings, fell into hysterics and demanded to be consigned to the police. As master and mistress suspect her after thirty years' service, Cook and old John begged that their boxes might be examined without loss of time. The kitchen maid and page boy, who had only lived a few years in the place, were less vehement but equally tearful. The old gardener and older coachman came to swell the chorus till poor Miss Colville, who would have as soon suspected the rector himself of the theft as any of the servants, was worn out, apologizing and soothing the household, and was provoked to say severe things to Coraline about her carelessness. When Mr. Ingotstone called the next day, things were still disturbed in the Colville household. Mr. Ingotstone was all sympathy. 
it was certainly a most extraordinary circumstance. Had Miss Colville applied to the police? No, said the rector, with the air of a man tired of the whole subject. I only wish the whole thing to be forgotten. We have had a perfect turmoil in this house for two days, and the servants are quite upset and good for nothing. The whole affair is a mystery. I begin to think Caroline has mislaid the trinkets herself. There, my dear, don't argue the matter all over again. Let us talk of something else. Could you identify your watch in any way, Miss Trent? asked Mr. Ingotstone. No, it was an ordinary gold one. I should know it again myself, of course, but it had nothing especial to distinguish it by. Except the number, said Mr. Ingotstone. Ah, oh, that I find I have lost. I did write it down once, but I cannot find the paper. You are sadly careless, Caroline, said Miss Colville, with unwanted severity. I do hope all this disturbance will be a lesson to you. The watch was never found, and the excitement of its loss died away. Mr. Ingotstone was now quite a stir in Shingleside society. He had taken a house and brought his mother down. We saw very little of her, as she was said to be an invalid and unable to go out much. But she presided at the entertainments Mr. Ingotstone gave at home. She was a stout, commonplace-looking woman very silent, very different to what one might have expected the mother of so elegant a young gentleman to be. But she was quite inoffensive, and her presence enabled Mr. Ingotstone to entertain the ladies of Shingle's side in a way impossible to a bachelor living alone. Such entertaining as went on at Ingotstone's, it quite equaled the parties of the manufacturing set. Mr. Ingotstone hired carriages and drove about all day. He organized all sorts of delightful excursions. Well, at all events, he gave us a very pleasant two or three months. Everyone liked him except the rector. I don't know why, but Mr. Colville never seemed so infatuated with him as everyone else. Lady Sophia was full of his praises. All the people were pleased with him, but the rector always appeared a little cool in the matter. Though Mr. Ingotstone was constantly at the rectory, and Caroline at least was glad to receive him, Mr. Ingotstone had been particularly attentive to her, to the great satisfaction of Miss Colville, who thought the match in every way a most desirable one. But the rector viewed the growing intimacy with some anxiety. He was extremely attached to his niece, the orphan child of his only sister, and pleasant and fascinating as Mr. Ingotstone, he desired to know more of the young man's antecedents before trusting him with Caroline's happiness. Perhaps this personal interest in the matter caused him to study the Ingotstones with a more critical eye than did the rest of the shingle side residents. He examined Lady Sophia about her protégé, but her ladyship was fully satisfied with her son's introduction and Mr. Ingotstone's connection with Lord Mortimer's family. Then he tried eliciting some information about the young man from himself, asking polite but leading questions which might reveal something about his personal history. But Mr. Ingotstone possessed the happy art of effectually baffling the purpose of the questioner, and with the frankest manner continued to answer the good rector's craftiest queries without in the least adding to his stock of information. One day, however, Mr. Colville chanced in what the police call a clue. At a tennis party at Lady Sophia's, the conversation turned on blindness and Mr. Ingotstone mentioned that he had known a young man restored to sight after years of total blindness, who was at first so embarrassed by the recovery of his lost sense that he was so obliged to shut his eyes to find his way about the house. Well, that must have been Henry Carey, my wife's young cousin, said the rector, pricking up his ears. Did you know him, Mr. Ingotstone? At the time you mentioned, he was at a clergyman's in Hampshire. A coach. 
Henry went there for the air and companionship of the other young men. Mr. Stowe, the coach, had six of them with him for the summer. I was once at Mr. Stowe's myself, said Mr. Ingotstone. And then, was it fancy? The rector thought he seemed sorry to have made this admission, for he turned the conversation rather abruptly and suggested that the game should be resumed. The rector was a bad correspondent and was never in the habit of writing long letters to his wife's young cousins, but that night he penned a pleasant, chatty epistle to Henry Carey, in the course of which he incidentally remarked, A former fellow student of yours, Mr. Ingotstone, is staying here. He came with excellent introductions, and all we shingleside folks are fetting him. Do you know anything of his family? He remembers you at Mr. Stowe's. Young men are rarely the most punctual of correspondence, so the rector was somewhat surprised to receive a reply to his letter by return of post, but still more was he startled at the contents of Henry Carey's epistle. If the ingot stone you mention is the same one who was at Old Stowe's some years ago, I advise you to be careful how you trust him especially with money. I've heard nothing of him since I left Hampshire, but his career there was anything but creditable. Here was a pleasant, vague kind of information, just sufficient to increase the rector's perplexities without solving them in the least. And to add to the annoyance, young Carey went on to say that he wrote at once as he was just leaving England for a tour in the Rocky Mountains, a convenient postal address and one from which the rector was likely to receive prompt answers to any further inquiries he might wish to make. Thrusting the disagreeable epistle into his pocket, Mr. Colville strolled through the village, debating what he had better do in the matter. Should he show the letter to Lady Sophia? The rector's sense of fair play revolted against attacking a man behind his back. Should he speak to Mr. Ingotstone himself? That was impossible. Should he write to Sir Algernon that young gentleman was at present on a tour in Palestine and as inaccessible as Henry Carey in the Rocky Mountains? However, Sir Algernon was to return home in a month, and the rector finally decided to let matters rest until then, quietly discouraging the intimacy between Mr. Ingotstone and Caroline. In fact, if possible, getting the latter away from Shingleside for a while. After all, Henry may be mistaken, or there may be two ingot stones, thought the rector, as he walked down the street, as he passed the door of the local jobmaster, Jakes, that worthy himself came out. I have said the rector was well off, and a liberal man to boot. Among his many acts of kindness, he was wont to advance money, free of interest, of course, to parishioners, who were in need of immediate small amounts and many a struggling tradesman and small farmer had blessed the timely aid of money against good book debts, which had to be waited for. Therefore, when Mr. Jakes craved the loan of twenty pounds for a few weeks, the rector was not altogether surprised at the application. Having often lent and been faithfully repaid before, he readily granted the request. You see, sir, all my dealings for the fodder and satches for ready money, pleaded Mr. Jakes in explanation, and I has to wait a bit for my bills being paid, but I shall have a fine lot to come in soon. Why, Mr. Ingotstone alone owes me nigh thirty pounds. Hasn't he paid you yet? asked the rector, Henry Carey's letter flashing uneasily across his mind. No, sir, he said he hated to draw checks for little sums, and he would pay as soon as his account came up to what he called a decent figure, and I have just sent in the bill and expected the money in a day or two. Do you think it wise to give such long credit to strangers? asked Mr. Colville. Lord, yes, sir, said Jakes confidently. Mr. Ingot Stone's a friend of Lady Sophia and Sir Algernon. He's all right, a pleasant liberal gentleman. Don't squabble about the price of anything. My money's safe enough. Shingleside tradesmen had little cause to be mistrustful, for we always paid our bills regularly, though 
In country fashion, our purveyors send in their accounts at less frequent intervals than do their sharper London brethren. The rector was now more uneasy than ever. Mr. Jake's confidence by no means reassured him. Casting his scruples to the wind, he called on various other tradesmen in the town, and without direct questioning, elicited that the Ingotstones owed money everywhere. None of the tradespeople appeared in the least uneasy, but the rector was miserable. He felt himself to be a spy and an eavesdropper, and at the same time a concealer of a guilty secret. I need not say that the manufacturing set made frantic efforts to gain over Mr. Ingotstone to their party. As soon as Miss Ingotstone had come, the wives of all the trade notables had called upon her, and she and her son were overwhelmed by the invitations. Mr. Ingotstone had received them civilly, of course, and occasionally accepted and returned their hospitalities, explaining to us that it was impossible to be churlish in this matter. Although, of course, he should never think of asking any of our set on the days when he entertained the manufacturing element, as he called it. I think his scrupulous care in this respect, and the little satirical anecdotes he used to relate of the ways and doings of the manufacturers, greatly increased his popularity with the better class of our society. The richest and vulgarest of all the new residents was a retired soap boiler named Horrocks. He was a widower with one daughter, who would have been prettier still to my mind if she had worn less jewellery, quieter colours, and brushed her hair smooth instead of making it into a tangle over her forehead. But plain or pretty, Flora Horrocks was very rich, and I had long had a suspicion that Mr. Ingotstone was paying her attention. I knew he was oftener at the Horrockses than other people imagined, and although it seemed incredible that he could dream of allying himself with such a family, still things looked suspicious, at least to me. For everyone else, even the dear rector, was so convinced that Mr. Ingotstone was only thinking of Caroline. Hmm, <laughs> to go back to my story, annoyances seemed to fall thick and fast on the rector on that one unlucky day. Returning home, vexed and weary, he encountered Mr. Horrocks and Flora. The rector was too kindly not to be on terms with the vulgarest of his parishioners, and stayed to bid them good day. Old Horrocks was beaming with good humour, and more vulgar and noisy than ever. Well, sir, he said, me and my little girl are going to have a fine outing tomorrow. Mr. Ingotstone is giving a picnic to a whole lot of us down at St. Barbara's. A pretty bay not far down the coast, a favorite spot for excursions. He's doing the thing well, too. Carriages to take us down. Meals at the hotel with plenty of his own fizz sent over. And a steamer ready to take us out in the afternoon, if we've a mind. Shall we have the pleasure of meeting you, Mr. Colville? A pretty bay not far down the coast, a favourite spot for excursions. I can't abide in wines. I think not. I am a busy man, you know, said the rector blandly. Old Horrocks laughed jovially. I was a busy man once, <laughs> if you like, he said. A boiling business keeps a man's nose pretty close to the grindstone. Now all I've got to do is to look after my little girl here. I shan't have that trouble much longer, eh, Flora? Oh, Pa, you do go on, murmured Miss Horrocks, blushing. And with maidenly embarrassment, she fumbled at her watch and drew it out. The rector's mind was now like a powder magazine. A spark was sufficient to set his suspicions aflame. And as Miss Horrocks innocently displayed her timekeeper, Mr. Colville mentally exclaimed, Caroline's watch, I do believe. He who engages in the role of a detective must throw honourable scruples to the wind. That is a pretty watch, Miss Horrocks, 
said the rector with a duplicity which was startling to himself. Would you allow me to look at it closer? Ain't anything remarkable, said Mr. Horrocks, as Flora offered it for inspection. Flo has a far finer one, all pearls on the back, but she wears this out of a bit of a sentiment, you know. It belonged to Mr. Ingotstone's favorite sister who died in consumption, and when he gave it to Flo, well, child, what are you winking at me for? Where's the shame of taking a gold watch from a man when you mean to take a gold ring from him by and by? Give you a turn in your parson's capacity, Mr. Colville. <laughs> and Mr. Horrocks laughed boisterously. It is a nice watch. You should take the number in case you lose it, said the rector, opening the case and noting the figures. Q-9-9. I tell you what, my gal, said the old soap boiler when Mr. Colville had passed on. The parson was regular took aback at hearing about you and your young man. I expect he made sure to get Ingotstone for Miss Caroline. Caroline Trent, indeed a poor shy thing without a word to say for herself, said Miss Horrocks, tossing her head. Fate had yet one more arrow in her quiver for the rector. As he entered the hall of his house, he encountered his niece. Look, uncle, cried Caroline, displaying a paper. I have found the number of my poor lost watch. I might have remembered it too, for it's all the same figures. Q-9-9, look. The rector sat down like a man who had received a pistol shot. Tell your aunt I want to speak to her in the library, my dear, he said, when he found his breath. In into Miss Colville's faithful ears he poured out all his story. What should he do? Do? said Miss Colville briskly. Don't meddle yourself at all in the matter. Put the loss of the watch in the hands of the police. And if this Mr. Ingotstone is an impostor, let them unravel the matter. Unless, said the good lady, suddenly remembering the discredit likely to fall on Shingleside by such a discovery. You let things go their own way till Sir Algernon comes home. And let Horrocks marry his daughter to a thief? asked the rector indignantly. It is all very dreadful, sighed Miss Colville, but even she shrank from keeping so guilty a secret, and it was decided that the rector should go up to London next morning and communicate with Scotland Yard authorities they being more likely to elucidate the mystery than the local constable, whose experience of such swindles was slight. Bright and cloudless rose the next morning, and as the rector drove to the station he saw the guests gathering at Mr. Ingotstone's, where a line of vehicles were waiting to convey them to their picnic. I feel like a traitor, yet what can I do? thought the unhappy clergyman. It is certainly a painful duty to appeal to the police about the character of a quondam guest, and at times on the journey Mr. Colville felt inclined to wish he had not stirred in the matter. His visit to Scotland Yard, however, was destined to be delayed. As he alighted at the London terminus, he felt his arm seized. Colville, what has brought you to London? I have just telegraphed you. The speaker was an old college friend whose mother had long been one of the Colville's most intimate acquaintances. Mr. Colville was her factotum in all money matters, her trustee and executor, and Miss Upfield, now lying on her deathbed, was anxious to see and consult with her old friend once more. Scotland Yard faded into the background. For the next three days Mr. Colville's time was at the disposal of his friends, nor was it until after Miss Upfield's death that he'd had time to think about the business which had brought him to London. In the meantime strange events had been taking place at Shingleside. The picnic passed off most harmoniously, fine weather and cheerful guests. Just as the party was preparing to start homewards, however, Mr. Ingotstone drew old Horrocks aside. A very awkward thing has happened, sir, 
I've actually been careless enough to leave my purse at home. You mischief you have, ejaculated old Horrocks. Yes, and the worst of it, that is not as if I was at Shingleside where I am known. There's all the feed to pay for, and the steamer excursion. Do you happen to have anything about you you can lend me till I get home? I apply first to the richest man in the company. Ha 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 ha. And Mr. Ingotstone laughed gaily. Horrocks grunted. <sighs> he did not love lending money, even for a few hours, into his future son-in-law. I suppose you must have what you want, he said. But it was a fool's act to forget your purse. My mind is rather unsettled right now, I am afraid. But it is your daughter's fault, you know. Well, there's forty pounds in that. I cashed a cheque to pay something this morning, said old Horrocks, producing a pocket book. How much do you suppose you'll want? Ten pounds? Oh, far more than that. A hotel bill is always a mystery. And then there's the steamer. I had better take the pocketbook as it is, and by a dexterous movement Mr. Ingotstone possessed himself of the money and quitted the room. Mr. Horrocks was silent and moody all the way home. It was offensive to his business ideas to have money borrowed from him at all, least of all in his careless, debonair fashion. Look here, Ingotstone. Remember, I want that forty pounds back he said, as he took leave of his host at his own door, and the young man replied laughingly, <laughs> You shall have it, my dear sir, <laughs> as soon as the bank opens in the morning and I can cash a cheque. But Mr. Horrocks did not receive his money that day, nor on the day following. The old manufacturer now began to grow uneasy. Business is business, he said to himself and when the third morning dawned and no Mr. Ingotstone appeared, he resolved to walk over to his future son-in-laws and ask for the money. In his triumph at securing a husband of Mr. Ingotstone rank for his daughter, Mr. Horrocks had been less careful in inquiring into the exact condition of the young man's finances than he might have been in the case of a person in his own class. Judging from the rate of his expenditure, Mr. Ingotstone must be a man of considerable means. And, as the old manufacturer had the brutality to keep repeating afterwards, he never doubted the respectability of any acquaintance of Sir Algernon and Lady Sophia. Even now, the doubt of Mr. Ingotstone's ability to pay never crossed the mind of his future father-in-law. Mr. Horrocks simply considered that the failure to return his forty pounds was the result of a careless, heedless way of conducting money affairs. Though this in itself was sufficiently abhorrent to a man of Mr. Horrocks's business views, so at an early hour in the morning the old man appeared at Mr. Ingotstone's house and rushed into his business without more ado. Well... Ingotstone, as my forty pounds don't seem coming to me, I'm coming after my forty pounds. Two hours ain't two days, you know, and business is business, even among friends. Quite true, my dear sir, said Mr. Ingotstone, with a shade of embarrassment in his manner. I am really ashamed at not having settled such trifle before, but the fact is, I have had a little run on my banking account lately and I am expecting a large remittance. My tenant's rents, in fact, paid in today, so as I knew it would be just the same to you if you received your money one day or the other. Sir, it is not at all the same to me, interrupted old Horrocks angrily. If I say I'll pay a man, I pays him, and I like to be dealt with as I deals. Upon my word, Ingotstone, he added between jest and earnest. If you find it so uncommon hard to come by forty pounds, I don't know how you'll manage to keep my daughter. I ain't going to let her throw herself away on you. Sir, you insult me, said Mr. Ingotstone, jumping up from his chair 
You shall have your beagerly forty pounds immediately. Had I known it was of such consequence to you, I would not have remained in your debt an hour. And he flounced out of the room, slamming the door behind him. Mr. Horrocks sat down, feeling a little ashamed of himself. He was often rebuked by his daughter for his lack of manners, and he began to be uneasily conscious that he had committed a breach of etiquette in thus dunning his prospective son-in-law in his own house. But I was only asking for my own, so he needn't have cut up so rough, he reflected. Arguing his conduct over in his own mind, he did not observe how the time was passing, till a glance the clock showed him that nearly a quarter of an hour had elapsed since Mr. Ingotstone had quitted the room. Old Horrocks waited another ten minutes, and then began to grow uneasy. He tried the door. It was locked. I am in no position to give an exact account of the events of the next few hours, but in the afternoon, when James the milkman was driving past the Ingotstone's house, it stood in a lonely part of Shingleside and few people passed it, his attention was attracted by the crashing of glass, and he found old Horrocks a raging like a lunatic and a bellowing like a bull having been locked up in an empty house since ten o'clock in the morning. Mr. and Miss Ingotstone, the servants, and the best part of the furniture were all gone. Need I dwell on the dreadful sequel, the story of our abused confidence and too rash kindness of strangers? The rector had made terrible discoveries at Scotland Yard where Mr. Ingotstone's history was a familiar tale. It seemed he really was a connection of the Mortimer family, a younger son having married, or said he married, a woman of low rank, an old earl who was one of the kindest men having undertaken to educate their only child, Mr. Ingotstone. Both Mr. Ingotstone's parents died in his infancy, but his uncle, the old earl, did everything to give him a fair start in life. Nothing, however, seemed to be of use. The boy appeared born bad. He was expelled from school. He was rusticated from college. At the time Henry Carey knew him, he had been sent to Mr. Stowe's as a chance of reforming him, but had been dismissed from that gentleman's house for appropriating the property of his fellow pupils. It would be endless to recount all his scrapes and delinquencies. His uncle had done all he could for him, even having him to stay at Mortimer Towers to keep him under his own eye. But the youth was absolutely incorrigible, and when the old earl died, his successor allowed Mr. Ingotstone a small yearly amount and washed his hands of him altogether. The young man was clever and well-educated with the manners of a gentleman. He traded upon these advantages and the circumstances of his connection with a good family to embark on a course of systematic swindling. In fact, he had already, under a feigned name, undergone a short term of imprisonment in Scotland for obtaining goods under false pretenses. When the rector mentioned that Miss Ingotstone had accompanied him to Shingleside, the detective said carelessly, Oh! Long sow with him again. He worked with her in his last little business. In fact, the reputed Miss Ingotstone and all the servants were members of an organised band of swindlers who worked with Mr Ingotstone. And we, the gentry of Shingleside, had been visiting and entertaining a returned convict and a woman known as Long Sal. The idea is too dreadful to dwell upon, and to make things worse, the officious police published our humiliation to the world by arresting Mr. Ingotstone for the theft of Caroline's watch. Flora Horrocks, who was a sharp girl, escaped the dreadful ordeal to which many of us were subjected, for as soon as she heard that Mr. Ingotstone was wanted, she joined some friends who were going to travel through Spain, and so could not be found to give evidence at the trial. But the poor rector, 
and Lady Sophia and Caroline and Mr. Horrocks were all summoned as witnesses, and I thought it would have killed the poor ladies. It did cost Caroline a brain fever. I really think the brazen impostor Mr. Ingotstone felt the matter less than any of us. Though he got a term of imprisonment, he never troubled to deny the theft of the watch and actually seemed rather amused at the evidence and the excitement which the business created. But just think of our position. Of course, all the tradesmen who had trusted Mr. Ingotstone lost their money, and they were ill-behaved enough to blame Lady Sophia for this and say they trusted her recommendation just as if the poor lady had not been as much deceived as they were. Mr. Horrocks, too, was most vulgar and disagreeable in his remarks, though his loss was really only a warning to persons in his rank of life not to be so eager to make acquaintances out of their own sphere. Lady Sophia found things so unpleasant that I can hardly blame her for discovering that England did not agree with her, selling her house at Shingleside and going to Pau for the winter. Still, she was a great loss to our society. The rector, poor man, was tied to his post and could not get away, though I think he would have been glad to do so. But Lady Sophia carried off Caroline with her to Pau as soon as the poor girl could be moved. I think Caroline felt the shock of that terrible discovery far more than did Flora Horrocks, who married a rich American she met in Spain only three months after she left England. They are still travelling about. I am told the American is enormously rich, devoted to her, and as vulgar as her father so it is a most suitable marriage. I wish I could hear poor Caroline was equally well consoled. I never listened to gossip, but I have heard some rumours about Sir Algernon who returned to England and took his mother and Caroline to Pau, where he remains with them, of course. The reader will expect to hear that Sir Algernon was crushed to the earth when he learned what terrible results his too rash acceptance of a pleasant travelling companion had brought upon Shingleside. I am sorry to confess that this was hardly the case. He was very grieved at the trouble caused to Caroline and the rector and the loss to the tradespeople actually paying some of the smaller ones to whom the money was an object. But what was the worst part of the deception, the discredit brought upon the best society in Shingleside, only seemed to amuse him. The dreadful idea that we, the resident gentry, had been duped into noticing a swindler and a woman known as Long Saul, appeared to him as an exquisite joke. He did not offend Lady Sophia's ears with this shocking sentiment, but... I blush to relate that in my own drawing-room this radical-minded young man spoke in terms of levity, of the hoax put on the exclusives of a shingles hide, that having entertained a convict you should be more ready to open your houses to the many pleasant, worthy people who are your neighbours. It is sad to see a young man heir to a fine property with such subversive ideas. As to opening our houses, I think the lesson we have learned is to be more exclusive than ever. I, for one, should be cautious at entertaining a stranger if he came with introductions from her gracious majesty herself, unless I could verify these recommendations from her own lips. Thank you for listening to That Delightful Stranger by Catherine Lord, published in Balgravia Christmas Annual 1896. I hope you enjoyed this reading and will follow along for part two, including Kari Nixon as she breaks it down into what we can learn from this tale. It does seem that the tale holds cautionary notes, but I'm sure that there are even deeper veins of Victorian criticism amongst one another. So I am delighted for that episode to come out next.
If you have not visited Victorian Periodical Parade via podchaser.com, please take a minute to head on over there and leave a comment, a rating, a note, feedback, anything you would like on this episode and any of the others that have touched you, moved you, or enlightened you, or even provided to you humor. It would be much appreciated. All in all, I hope you have a great day. Thank you very much.